Your Excellencies, Vice President Meriton, Secretary of State Fowler, Lady Catherine Moncham, Chairman Maxim Bahar, Dr. Justin Valentin, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gordon Anderson, President of Paragon House Publishers in the United States, Editor of International Journal on World Peace, and a good friend of the late Sir James Moncham. I was pleased to be asked to send greetings to the Forum on Place for Peace and Understanding organized by the Sir James Moncham International Center for Peace Studies and Diplomacy. I became acquainted with Sir James at a conference on global violence, crisis, and hope in New York City in October 2001, just a month after the 9-11 events that destroyed the World Trade Towers. I agreed with Sir James that it is important for Americans to understand better how people outside the United States view U.S. foreign policy, and we published his book, War in America, Seen from the Indian Ocean. We published his autobiography in 2009, and his comprehensive book on the Seychelles, The Saga of a Small Nation Navigating the Cross Currents of a Big World, in 2015. We also published President James Michel's book, Rethinking the Oceans, in 2016. During those 15 years, Sir James and I became close friends. He came to visit me in Minnesota three times, and I went to the Seychelles, and we met at several international conferences. Sir James was a champion of peace and global understanding, and a tireless representative and promoter of Seychelles wherever he went. There could be no more fitting way to remember him than a Peace and Studies Diplomacy Center named in his honor. One point that Sir James continually emphasized was the distinction between a politician and a statesman. This distinction is important both for governance of a state and in foreign affairs. A politician is a term that often carries a negative connotation because of the tendency to use and manipulate governments and national resources for power, wealth, self-interest, the interest of a political party, and its backers. When a politician gets something for himself or herself, his party, or his cronies, it usually occurs at the expense of others. A statesman, on the other hand, sees the big picture and lives to serve everyone. A statesman works to grow the economic pie for all, not just divide it for the benefit of a few with power. Sir James worked to develop the airport in Seychelles as an example of his statesmanship. In foreign affairs, a politician might work for the strategic national interests at all costs, using power and force to coerce other states, or a statesman works for win-win relationships that will lead to more prosperous and harmonious world for all. I hope that the diplomacy aspect of the Moncham Peace Center and diplomacy will always seek to pursue the higher consciousness of the statesman when engaged in diplomatic relations. I was also asked to say a few words about the role of peace in independent non-governmental initiatives, or NGOs. It is important to say that governments are very important in the creation of what we call negative peace. Negative peace is the absence of war, and it is obtained by providing secure borders and through good relations with other states. It is also important to foster the absence of domestic violence through good laws and a police force that protects everyone's basic rights to life and opportunity. On the foundation of negative peace, positive peace can be built. Positive peace is related to the prosperity and happiness of people. Governments cannot create this. Governments are based on force, as expressed in law. They cannot force a person to be happy, to love another person, to be responsible, or to be productive. Societies are composed of three sectors, governance, economy, and culture. Each sector is based on a different principle, a government on force, an economy on trade in the market, and culture on love and a sense of purpose and responsibility. Non-governmental organizations generally fall in the culture sector of society. They are moved by compassion for victims of war and disease, those in poverty, and a sense of injustice. 
In traditional societies, families, tribal elders, and religions took up the cultural mantle, teaching people to serve others and providing rules for an ethical life like the Ten Commandments. But since the rise of science and the collision of cultures on a global level, many religious structures and dogmas have been challenged and relativized. Traditional families are being transformed by industrialization and modern technology. NGOs have arisen to help fill the gap left by the breakdown of these traditional cultural institutions and to meet the humanitarian challenges on a global level. The resettlement of refugees, the resolution of conflict, and the dispensing of food and medicine are primarily related to negative peace. Security and a place to live for refugees and health for the sick and the starving. But these things do not provide people with a sense of meaning or cause them to be happy. Many people living in secure environments still lack a sense of purpose and the economic skills to pursue their dreams and live happily and peacefully with each other. Elements of positive peace. NGOs can work to remind governments and corporations to behave better and be better structured to serve the whole society in creating freedoms and justice. But NGOs can also help ensure that people are aware of their own responsibilities and their desire to achieve positive peace and happiness, and that other cultural institutions like schools, churches, synagogues, and the media, and sports leagues are aware of the responsibilities that complement human rights and freedoms. In this respect, NGOs as cultural entities representing the dreams and aspirations of people stand above the governments and economic institutions that should function to enable these dreams and aspirations to become realized. I encourage you in your deliberations the next two days to keep in mind the differences between negative and positive peace, and that the first involves security and force, but the second requires voluntary responsibilities and skills. Since the UN International Declaration of Human Rights passed in 1948, 70 years ago, the world has become highly conscious of human rights, but the achievement of these rights is based on the exercise of responsibilities. It is important that NGOs put an effort into understanding human motivations and responsibilities required in achieving human rights that we have put it into legal reforms in countries around the world. Congratulations on the organization of this conference, and I wish you a great success. Thank you.